Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located around the world. My name is Lindsay Velasina with Scrum.org and welcome to today's Scrum Pulse. I will be your moderator today. And today we have professional Scrum trainer, Lavanish Gautam, and he is going to talk with us about how to complete Scrum. So he's gonna walk us through some of those complimentary practices that can help you tailor Scrum to your needs. So with that, I'm gonna dive into some quick items here before we get into the content. So next slide, please. All right, so your microphones will be muted throughout, but we do want you to ask questions as you have them. So please utilize the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the Q&A with the speech bubbles. You can use that. And then if you have technical questions, feel free to use the chat feature, but we wanna keep the questions separated from the chat. So please keep that in mind. And this session is being recorded. So you will get a link in your email to this session and the slides as well within 24 hours. So please keep an eye out for that. And you can also always find it at scrum.org slash webcasts. And with that, we can go to the next slide. So just a little bit about scrum.org. We are the home of Scrum. We were founded by Ken Schwaber, the co-creator of Scrum back in 2009. And we offer training certification in professional Scrum. And we also offer a lot of ongoing learning opportunities we know that learning goes far beyond the classroom, so please feel free to check out all of the free learning resources we have on our website, including other webinars like this one, and I hope that this webinar today plays an important part in your learning journey. So with that, uh, Lavanish, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and go to the next slide? Okay, thank you, Lindsay. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon awesome people. So my name is Lavnish. I am professional scrum trainer with scrum.org and I am born and brought up in India, but living in United Kingdom since the past 13 years or something. And apart from being a professional scrum trainer, I also do a bit of coaching and consulting through my company called Edge Agility Limited. And uh, I have got lots of experience, especially in building the products and the services. Okay which customers they love to use, but also the teams they love to produce as well. Good. So almost 16 plus years of experience in building awesome products and the services. And if you want to know more about it, once you will get this slide deck, you will have this link from which you can connect with me on the LinkedIn as well. So feel free, okay? A little non-obvious information about me. I have got a four year old daughter, okay? And she is going to be back from the school probably in next 10, 15 minutes. And sometimes very much like any stakeholder, she just enters into my room, okay? So if you see that one head is appearing here or there, don't get scared, it's just one four-year-old, okay? Now, with this little information about me, I would like to talk a little bit about what Scrum Guide says about the Scrum in and itself, okay? So first, so I what I have got is I have brought in some paragraphs, some lines that are coming directly from the Scrum Guide. So the first one, what is Scrum is? So Scrum Guide says that the Scrum is a lightweight framework, but framework to generate the value, okay? And it is for the complex systems and the products where we have got more unknowns than the knowns in itself, okay? So the purpose of Scrum is to generate the value. Okay? Now, the second thing, if you'll see, if you read the Scrum Guide carefully, you will find that there is one more sentence in there which talks about that Scrum is purposefully incomplete. So the true source of the Scrum says that Scrum is purposefully incomplete. So hence, we have to make it complete, isn't it? Okay, And that's where they have also mentioned at the bottom uh, of the Scrum Guide as well that in the Scrum, that we have to use, uh, not have to use, we can use various processes 
techniques, methods, framework to make it complete as well. We need to add our context to generate the values. So remember, Scrum is one of the way how we can generate the value. So our key aim is to generate the value in an Excel. And if I talk a little bit about the Scrum framework in an Excel, and I will bring my pointer as well, that what Scrum framework pretty much is. So you will see that Scrum framework starts at this end where we have got product backlog, product backlog, which is pretty much driven from the product goal. When we have got this product backlog, which is the ordered list of everything that goes into the product, it becomes an input for our first event of the sprint, sprint planning, where a Scrum team, they look into this product backlog and create the sprint goal and also the sprint backlog as well, which is actually the plan for the Scrum team to deliver the value, something valuable increment in itself to achieve our sprint goal, which is one step forward towards our product goal as well. Now this uh, sprint backlog, which is our plan for the sprint get discussed uh, into one event called the daily scrum. Developers, they look into it, they check how the progress is going, they uh, update that sprint backlog and that work is always keep on happening. And eventually few of our product backlog items, when they meet the definition of done, the increments comes to the life. This increments gets inspected with the stakeholders into an event called the sprint review where they provide us the feedback, but also they help us in setting up the future of the product as well. And towards the end, our scrum team, they come together and find out how we can improve ourselves in terms of the tools, processes, behavior, collaboration, communication, and all that. And this cycle of the sprint is keep on working. So this pretty much what the Scrum framework is. But we do get a lot of question whenever we started working uh, uh, with the Scrum is, okay guys, how did we reach here? From where that product goal is coming from, okay? It's many of the organization where do we work it's not like you got the idea and from the next day you can start working on the scrum. It, we do few things as well, okay? That what happens before the scrum starts, that's something that we need to add as well. But then what happens after when we have got increment as well? Do we release it? Even if we release it, how do we know whether that increment has delivered the value or not, okay? And you can see that there are some element that we still need to keep on doing, which probably are not fitting in this uh, picture right now as well. And if you see that, um, I generally say that uh, to generate the value, we go through a cycle of identification of the value, also delivery of that value, and then keep measuring that value as well. And majority of the time, Scrum pretty much works in this space, delivery of the value. So there are tools, there are practices which can help the Scrum not only in the delivering the value, but also helping in the identification of the value and also measuring the value as well. So I'm going to talk about few complementary practices that can help the Scrum in generating the more value. And the first one, which I'm going to talk about is the product management. And here where, what I mean by project product management is not a job title, not a part of the function in any organization. Here with the product management, I mean is certain techniques and also skills that requires for the products to generate the value as well. Okay, and the few things, uh, in my experience, which definitely supports the product management functions and the skills and the techniques are these three. So product vision. Uh, product vision is our motivation behind the product in and itself. Okay. And it is our why, that why we are building the product in and itself as well. And it acts as our North Star. So whenever we get lost, which generally happens a lot in any of the product development, we can always look into this product vision and redirect our, ourselves into the right path, okay? So for an example, uh, 
couple of years back, I was working in um, an educational technology organization and uh, we were working some learning management system. So one of our product vision was around enabling learners, trainers, and ad administrator to collaborate, also grow and learn as well. So this is what our motivation was. So product visions, generally, they are very inspiring. They are driven. They are very purposeful. When we, we have got our why clear, uh, we actually convert this product vision into set of strategy. Product strategy is our high level plan to meet our product vision. Generally, it answers basically, I would say few questions, definitely by minimum. First, who the product is for? What kind of problems and the needs for those people are we solving as well? But at the same time, how do we generate the value for my organization as well. So yes, customer value is important, but at the same time, business value is also important as well. And product strategy includes both of it, okay? Then what generally happens is this product strategy turns into some kind of our plan, which gets reflected into our product roadmap. What we are going to work on to our next few sprints, what we'll be working on probably in the next three months, what are going to our key goals? What are the features that we are going to work in the future as well? Product roadmap communicates how this vision and the strategy turn into some kind of actionable plan as well. Okay. So how these things are connected, I'll show you. Okay. So how this strategy to execution gets connected as well. So we have got this high level plan, which is the vision and the strategy. And then here we have got product details. So if you see this, this is where pretty much the Scrum operates. We have got product goal. And then with the help of the product goal, we started identifying our product backlog items. Product goal helps in the evolution of the product backlog and in itself. So item at the top, they are more refined than the item uh, below it. But sometimes there is a big gap between this high level strategy, high level vision, and this product details in itself. And this is where the roadmap comes in. Roadmaps helps in filling this gap between our overall strategy to our day-to-day -day working, which is our product backlog items and the product goal in itself. So one of the uh, key person, I would say if you follow this person for the product related thing. Roman Pichler is one of the product guru, which I love to follow. Okay. And he says product roadmap as an actionable plan to communicate how product is likely to evolve. And guys, product do evolve. Okay. Our products are filled with so many assumptions in and itself. Now, these things like vision, strategy, and the product goal, they are helping us in creating in enabling the transparency, okay? Transparency about our why, transparency about what we are going to build, transparency about who is going to get benefit of this product and also who is going to build as well. Also transparency about when we can expect these items as well and also how we are going to reach there as well. This enhanced transparency creates opportunity for the inspection and adaptation which pretty much is the foundation of the Scrum framework. Empiricism, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. So these tools can help us in enabling that. There are a few complementary practices that you can help, uh, that you can use to support these uh, sections as well. So something like product vision, we can use uh, elevator pitch as defined in the book called Crossing the, Crossing the Chasm. So when uh, you will get this PDF at the end, once this webinar is over, there will be few links using which you can learn more about these few techniques as well. So elevator pitch is a really nice way of defining our product vision in itself. Another one is the product uh, box. So the product box is a very creative way of defining our product vision as well. 
Another one is also the business problem statement. So we can write down our business problem statement to talk about that what is the purpose, what is the why behind our product in itself. When we're talking about the product strategy, there are lots of canvases like business model canvas, lean canvas, uh, value proposition canvas, lean UX canvas, which can help us in setting up our strategies. So if you follow those canvases, they all of those canvases generally talk about who the users are, who the key users are, what the problems these users are having, how we are going to generate the revenue or reduce the cost or reduce the risk, and also what are, what are our key value propositions as well. These visions, strategy, they help us in bringing the why to our work, which I feel many teams, they struggle with. They have got always focus on the something like user stories, features, but how we have used to those features and the user stories. This product management techniques help us in building that why into our work. And hence, I think if anything that you would like to add on to the Scrum framework, probably the first thing should be add those product management skills and the techniques. Now, user experience. Though sometimes the user experience I would consider as a part of the product management in itself, but I have called this thing out separately because in many organizations, they consider user experience as a separate function as compared to the Scrum. And to me, it creates a lot of uh, issues in, that, in those organizations. So, so what happens is teams, Delivery teams, which generally I would say the scrum team, they always focus on, okay, we have got these features to build, 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 build. And they are very far off from the who the users are, why we are building the things. And sometimes they lack that experimentation culture as well, that learning culture as well. And because of that, many times they turn into the feature factories where our aim is to build more, 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 more. But sometimes, building more does not generate the value. And hence, I keep talking about this thing that, remember, Scrum is not the end. Scrum is the means to generate the value as well. And hence, we have to keep bringing our focus back to the value. Okay. So in my experience, user experience and the Scrum, they are trying to achieve the same objective which is about generating the value by satisfying customer needs and the problems. And hence, we not only need to understand our customers, we also need to understand their needs and the problems as well. But all these things are assumptions so far. And hence, I would say this: how the Scrum, how the user experience helps in supporting the Scrum is by enabling that experimentation culture. So if you get the uh, chance, uh, please uh, read through this book, Lean UX uh, by Joshua Sedan and Jeff Goodolf. Okay. Uh, and this book is really, uh, really great work. And it talks about that how agile uh, techniques like Scrum and the UX can be incorporated together. And we also talk about in this book is that that when we talk about the experiments, sometimes we always think of those big experiments, but we can also learn few little experiments to learn more about our users, our customers, our also their needs and the problems as well. Okay, so what we can do is we can uh, do paper prototypes. Okay, we can also do uh, some kind of clickable prototypes as well. We can also do the feature fakes. Landing pages, these are lots of different kind of experiments that uh, Scrum teams can run, which can incorporate the UX principles and then can gain benefit of it. We can build that experimentation, the learning culture. And UX uh, uh, skills also help us in building the hypothesis in a better manner as well. So when I'm talking about hypothesis, hypothesis are nothing but the statement around our assumptions. So we believe that 
this will this user will get this benefit when they use this feature it's your hypothesis but when you do the hypothesis driven development you also call it out that how we will know whether that hypothesis has been proven or not so we run an experiment we measure the results and that's when we check that okay our hypothesis has been proven or not with whether this is the right user whether this need really exist or not whether these people actually value these needs or the problems or not and hence user experience bring that customer centricity which in many case i see is missing in many of the scrum teams so i give you one example last year i was uh, working as a product coach with uh, one of the organization and i was looking into their product backlog item and one of the product backlog item was written in a user story format and their user story was like as a tester i want so that and i was like as a tester tester is not the user okay and hence guys we need to bring the value within our product backlog item as well okay so i think when we work on the user experience this is where our focus comes back in okay next now because we are talking about the user experience another framework which can help in measuring the value and also identifying the value is the evidence based management so maybe i am a little bit biased about it because it's a creation of the scrum.org but this is something i would say has been really uh, a ground breaking for me at least in the past 2 3 years and last year i was working with one large uh, banking organization and uh, we implemented scrum with the evidence based management uh, framework and i could see the how the mindset shift happened not only at the team level but also at the leadership and the management level as well their mindset shift from their old way of uh, measuring the things like resource utilization deadline driven development chasing those timelines to the more important things like the customer satisfaction feature usage technical dash and also time to learn and cycle time as well so to me uh, i always consider this as you get what you measure if you are measuring the busyness of the people you will get the busy people but if you are measuring the value probably you will start getting the value in the long run as well and hence what we measure matters a lot so in the ebm framework you can see that ebm framework generally has got three element first an ebm framework has got goals so ebm has got this strategic goal intermediate goal and immediate tactical goal each of these immediate tactical goal is supporting this intermediate goal and each of this intermediate goal is taking us one step closer toward our strategic goal if i try to compare this with the scrum framework i can say that maybe this strategic goal is very much like our product vision and our intermediate goal would be very much close to the product goal that we call in the scrum and the immediate tactical goal could be very much closer to the sprint goal as well so again our tactical goal always there to support our bigger goals as well but then how we reach from our current state to our next state this is where ebm talks about the experimentation loop in itself where we build hypothesis we run the experiments once those experiments are delivered we inspect and adapt very much in line with the scrum uh, terminology in and itself where we say in the scrum the scrum is founded upon the empirical process where we make decision based on what is known okay. in the epm framework if you are using apart from the goal there are two more things as well first is the measures as well and here we have got uh, Uh, in the key uh, in four key value areas into the ebm each of these key value areas they are answering us certain specific questions so the top half of this 
EBM framework talking about the market value, the business value that our product organizations have got. But then sometimes just focusing on the market value is not sufficient enough. We also need to see whether we can actually deliver that value or not, whether we have got that ability to deliver the value or not. Okay. So hence, these bottom two key value areas, which is the ability to innovate and the time to market, they help us in understanding our ability to deliver those values as well. What is really great about this EBM framework is that it says one thing, that there is no one metric that rules all. It is always the combination of the metric. Yes, at certain point of time, an organization and the product maybe would like to focus on one area. Okay, But remember that when you focus on one area, you may encounter certain risk in the other areas as well. So for an example, if our teams, they're only focusing on the time to market, build faster, 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 faster. In that pursuit, sometimes what happens is we start uh, cutting the quality in. And essentially what happens is our quality goes down. To me, quality is the current value. And if, that quality is going down. Sometimes what also happens is our teams also start incorporating the technical debt and hence our ability to innovate also goes down. So the key message which I want to pass here is that when we are focusing on one key value area, remember that you are incorporating certain risks. And hence, what do you want to check is, even though if I'm focusing on one area, I am not negatively impacting the other areas as well. And hence, you need to identify certain metrics, certain measures that would define that key value area. So how to use evidence-based management uh, framework along with the Scrum? Think about what is the value my organization or my products are offering today? How we can measure it? And this will be very different for different products in and itself. So for an example, if I am delivering a training, for me, the feedback which I'm getting from the people, the reviews which I'm getting, number of people I'm teaching, that would probably would be my current value. Okay, But for whereas uh, for any digital product, it could be the total number of users they have got. Okay, Total number of people who are landing onto their website, onto their app. How many active users you have got as well? What is your churn rate? All those things will define your current value, okay? And then you also need to figure it out, okay, what is the unrealized value? Unrealized value is the potential that you see in the market. Unrealized value can occur with some outsider industry triggers as well. So very good example I can give here right now is chat GPT, yeah? In Few months back, ChatGPT came and all of the sudden, majority of all the organization and all the industries, now they are seeing that there is an opportunity or a threat because of this artificial intelligence. And suddenly our unrealized value in many products and in the industry has got increased. So even though sometimes organizations will focus on the current value, but you cannot have the blind eye around this unrealized value. Because if you do, this unrealized value can eat up all your current value in the long run. Very much like the Nokia phones. At one point of time, Nokia phones were the market leader, but something happened into the industry, touch screen phone came, and the unrealized value started increasing. And Nokia failed to tap onto that unrealized value. And essentially, eventually, their current value went out. So, guys, this is where EBM framework can help you in identifying the right metrics for your team and the product and your organization. By measuring these metrics, we can check our progress towards the goal. And this is how we will be using EBM to help our products, help our organization in their journey to achieve our goals that we got.
Next, this is one of my favorite, Kanban. Okay, so uh, in many organizations, and I will soon say many organizations, even if you go onto some social media platform like, uh, like LinkedIn, you see, use Scrum, use Kanban, Kanban versus Scrum. But why? Why we have to create everything into some kind of dual? Okay, we already see a dual between user experience, Scrum, dual. And also, we all see a big dual in the Scrum and the Kanban. But whereas Scrum is good, Kanban is good, together they are awesome. Okay, so what Kanban is, Kanban is a strategy of optimizing the flow of the value. Remember, what was the purpose of Scrum? Generating the value. And Kanban is also trying to achieve the same objective in and itself. And if we have got same objective, why not we work together? Why we have to fight with each other? Okay. And I have seen when Scrum teams, they work uh, in tandem uh, with, with Kanban, they become, I think, the super awesome. If you want to know more about this, guys, there is a, a Kanban guide for the uh, Scrum teams. So explore the scrum.org website and you can find into the resources this Kanban guide for the uh, uh, Scrum team. Okay. Really, really great uh, resource. Now, a little bit more about the Kanban as well. So in the Kanban, we focus on the four key principles. So a few principles are like visualization of the workflow, where team identify how the value flows within the system. This is step, then this is step, then this step, and this step, and done. Okay. For many teams, this could be different. For some kind of software product development, this could be, okay, we have got some kind of user or the product discovery work. After that product discovery work, we are going to build few things. After that, we are going to validate few things and then we reach to the done. In your organization, these things can be divided into further different columns as well. But understanding this workflow, I think is really, really uh, important. And it helps us in understanding and seeing where the waste is happening within our system. Where the waste is happening within our system. So something like dependencies. When we look into that our workflow, we will see that, okay, we have got dependency and to do this, we have to do something with the other team. And when we learn that, okay, there are dependencies in terms of technical or the business decisions and all, all these things, they start creating some kind of impediments for our team. And this is pretty much, I think that Kanban shows a mirror to our scrum teams as well that where the flaw is happening. What are the impediments we have got within the flow of the value? So if we are using the Scrum uh, with Kanban, it helps in bringing the collaboration as well. And this is where this uh, second practice, which is the limiting in work in progress could be really handy. So if I'm using the Scrum with Kanban, my daily Scrum goes very much like, okay guys, this is the top priority, product backlog item right now. We are working on it. What's happening in there? And people that they can start talking about it that, oh yeah, I am doing a little bit of coding on this. And after this, I will be finished by midday. Maybe someone who is going to do a bit of testing or the validation that they, then they can say, okay, mate, before you move this ticket to this environment, to this environment, can we have a little conversation? And when my teams, they use the Scrum with the Kanban, the focus move away from those individual status to actually work. I have seen many daily Scrum, which sounds something like this. Uh, yesterday, I worked on the Jira ticket 13984. Uh, today, we are going to work on the Jira ticket 76984 and no impediments, thank you. And the next person start again. In that kind of daily scrum, it looks like people are just going with the motion. Okay, Nobody is listening to each other. There is lack of collaboration. Sometimes they are probably talking to the scrum master rather than talking to the, each other. 
when we use scrum with kanban our focus back onto the work in itself and because you are pulling uh, putting uh, the whip limits as well and when you reach to the whip limit you are not going to pick the new item go and help someone else and through this what i have seen is the cross functionality of my scrum teams got improved over the time period because the collaboration was increasing but also we were able to identify where the dependencies are where the waste and the weight is happening and it and when we identified that thing we were able to work towards it when we are working scrum with kanban it gives us data for better sprint retrospective as well guys in the previous sprint this product backlog item our cycle time was too high what happened with it oh it got blocked by 3 days why there was a blocker okay because we were waiting for certain decisions okay guys let's have a talk about that how, how this 3 days gap could be reduced or be eliminated and hence our sprint retrospective become more meaningful more powerful and more action packed rather than just doing what is going good what is not going good any actions so scrum with kanban if you're using it it can help in improving your scrum events massively your sprint planning will go shorter and more powerful your daily scrum would be more work oriented your sprint review would be more powerful because you can talk you have got at least done increment and then also your sprint retrospective will also be very powerful as well because now you have got some data that you can talk about as well next thing which i would like to also talk about is the facilitation and why i am talking about facilitation is that post pandemic things have got changed we have started working in remote world okay and in the remote world i think the need of effective facilitation is much more as compared to when it was the face to face world okay in the face to face world yes i could see that okay uh, the people's body language and if i can observe the people's body language probably i can ask them some questions oh mate a sprint review a stakeholder you i saw that you had a cringe moment can you please tell me what did you like what did you not like about this particular feature in itself okay i could do all those things but it becomes very difficult to have the same thing into the remote world and hence we need effective facilitation we need effective facilitation so that the loud voices do not overpower the quieter voices and which can happen you want to make your events more participatory you want to make your event purpose driven each and every scrum event has got a purpose and good facilitation technique can help us back to those focus by involving everybody's ideas by involving other people's perspective by brainstorming ideas as well so i give you one example so to in this slide you are seeing that there is a a book front page is here this book is the liberating structures liberating structures are a great way of facilitating the group conversation there are 33 of them okay and one of the liberating structure is 1 2 4 all in this 1 2 4 all what do you do is you invite everybody give them one minute to write down the individual writing then you divide the people into the pairs to explore more ideas generate more ideas then those two pairs they come together and refine their ideas further as well and then do a group of four come together and explain the summary of their discussion to the rest of the group now when we doing this what happens is one two four all make it very inclusive everybody participates you are giving chance to even the people who are quieter you are even given chance to the people who are introverts as well who do not feel really comfortable in talking in front of the camera not everybody feel 
really great talking in front of the cameras. But using this technique like one, two, four, all, you are providing that opportunity to them. And also, you are generating more and more ideas in a very quick turnaround time in itself. So it helps in generating the ideas. So especially when we have got things like the product backlog refinement and also the sprint planning, we can use one, two, four, all to explore multiple options, multiple ideas, multiple techniques. And this is where if you are using this user experience with the Scrum, with the Kanban supported by this great facilitation, you can see that experimentation culture and the learning culture will automatically start coming in as well. And people, they will feel more included, more involved into those discussions as well. Another liberating structure is the Troika Consulting. So in the Troika Consulting, what happens is that you have got a problem. One person owns that problem and that person talks about that problem to the other people. And then other two people, they generate idea to solve this problem. When I have used Troika Consulting, with the one to four all, what I have found out is the team this learn how to solve their own problem without someone else having. And this, I think, enables the self-management. Self-management is a really essential for the Scrum teams. And I think great facilitation, Kanban, user experience, these things, they are not only supporting the founding block of the Scrum framework, which is transparency, inspection, adaptation, but also the other founding block of the Scrum framework, which is around the cross-functionality and the self-management. Great facilitation also support the Scrum values as well. If you are doing the good facilitation, you can enable the openness among the people. You can bring the people's focus back onto the purpose of the Scrum event or maybe whatever the uh, meeting that you are having as well. You can bring the people's commitment that, yes, we have to meet a purpose of this event as well. So all those Scrum values of respect, commitment, focus, uh, courage, they start coming and living when we are using the great facilitation as well. So. Yes, there are many other complementary practices as well. So something like you can use extreme programming as well. There are scaling techniques like Nexus. There are hundreds of complementary practices. And probably I cannot talk about all of those techniques in the given time frame. So hence, I chose five most, uh, I would say, complementary practices that has helped me in uh, generating the value with using the Scrum. Product management, that helps in building the why within our work. User experience, that helps in building the learning and the experimentation culture and bring the customer and the user centricity. Evidence-based management framework, which brings the focus back on the data in and itself, the right metrics and the right measures. Kanban that help us in optimizing the workflow and actually it helps a lot our uh, conversation into the scrum events like the daily scrum retrospective and the sprint planning and also great facilitation as well using techniques like liberating structure working agreements and the other facilitation techniques and the principles like participatory probably we can include other people generate more ideas and maybe complete our Scrum as well. Okay. Questions. I'm open for the questions now. Lizzie? All right, fantastic. So we have quite a few questions. Thank you so much for that, Lavanish. That was such a great um, overview with some great examples there as well. So let's start going through some of these questions. And if we don't get through all of these audience, I am going to be sharing all of the open questions with Lavanish. And Lavanish also is having an Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer session on June 14th, where you can come back and ask more questions to Lavanish. And I will share that link at the end of this event. So um, 
stay tuned for that as well. So let's dive into some questions. So this question from Anita, what's your opinion about companies having both product owners and product managers? Ooh. <laughs> Big question. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. And this is where I would say that sometimes I think our focus goes into those dwells a lot. Oh, product owner, product manager. What we need to see is what we call product owner in the Scrum framework. In the Scrum framework, product owner is not a job title. In the Scrum framework, product owner is, a, is an accountability. Right. And, it, and it may happen that your job title is something else, but you are fulfilling the accountability of the product owner. So in one example, uh, Lindsay, I used to work in a software product company. And for three months, my organization's chief information security officer, the C-level executive, were acting as a product owner for the security work that we were doing. So job Makes title... Sense. And in the accountability, I think we need to separate it as well. Okay. And we need to see who is the person who takes the ultimate decision. Make ultimate decisions, probably that person is the product owner from the Scrum perspective. And it may happen that person's job title in your organization is something else. Okay, great. And I think in some instances, um, if there are multiple product managers and things like that, product managers could also act potentially be acting as developers on the Scrum team, correct? Yes, definitely. Because um, I always consider product management as an skill. That skill that all the Scrum team should have. And generally product owners, they are very good with the product management, but what happens is when our product start scaling, we will see that the product owner, they have to do so much things like uh, stakeholder management, identifying the value, measuring the value. And hence, it is always helpful that we have got people within the team who can also support the product owner in those product management activities as well. That is always and always helpful. Great, thank you. All right, so this next question. Can you suggest when the definition of done should be created? Should it be created during sprint planning and revised during the sprint retrospective? So what do you recommend? First thing we should see that, okay, what the definition of done is. So definition of done is a commitment. Definition of done defines uh, uh, what is a usable, workable, potential usable, uh, increment will look like. So it is talking about the quality criteria that our product and the increment needs to have. And I think when we are going into the sprint planning, that is one of the key input for the sprint planning. Because to have the definition of done, sometimes we also need to consider the organizational aspects as well. Some organizations, they have to follow certain regulations. So my recommendation would be probably before the sprint planning, okay? You have got definition of done. And if not, then definitely create that definition of done into your first sprint planning, okay? But definition of done also evolves as you learn more. You right. learn about your practices, approaches and all. And I would say retrospective is a really great space when we should revisit our definition of done, especially into the early product development. We learn a lot. So my tip would be, especially in the early product development, make definition of them as a must-have topic for a retrospective. Talk about what can we add to improve our quality from the technical perspective, but also from the product perspective as well. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. All right, so this next question, if developers are from different countries, is it a good practice to hold the daily scrum online, or if they're not together in the same place, their meeting cannot be called the daily scrum. So maybe just in general, do you wanna just share some tips for the daily scrum for remote teams that are in different locations and how to, how to work around that? So, and really that's uh, one big challenge that we are facing, isn't it, Lindsay? Especially in yeah. the post pandemic. 
that yes, earlier we used to have this whiteboard, we can go around there and then we can right. have this conversation. Right, and pre-pandemic too, if teams are in different countries, different time zones, that type of balance as well. Yeah, so, so I think whether we can have the daily scrum online, I think yes, or maybe that's the only choice we have got in certain situations in and itself. Because right. if you are into the two different location, I don't think how you can physically be at the same place. Right. So probably the virtual and the online is the only option that we got. But yes, and this is where we need to uh, talk a little bit about the better facilitation techniques as well. Again, each team is different. So hence, I would suggest to set up certain working agreements around the daily scrum as well. Okay. What is the common time when we should meet together? So one uh, tip I would say is have some kind of virtual board. So if you are using certain tools like uh, Jira, ADO, or whatever it is, okay, I would say talk the work rather than those individual status update. Okay, if you are using the Scrum with Kanban, that would be really helpful as well because you have got your workflow right. set up in your uh, daily Scrum, and then you can talk about the work. Top item, guys, what's happening with it? People can talk about it and then collaborate. Then the next item, what is happening with it? People can then collaborate and have a discussion as well. But if you make it turn like, okay, we are nine people and say, okay, Lindsay, what's your status? Oh yeah, I am going to work on the Jira ticket 76984 and this and that. Other people, I can bet they are not even listening. So the daily scrum is one of the great opportunity for us to collaborate actually. Right, not a status meeting. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, this next question, it shifts into Scrum with Kanban. So this person asked, if I use Kanban in the Scrum context, can you give us some examples of good workflows and bad workflows? And it looks like somebody else asked the same question, unless it was the same person. Okay. So good what defines a good workflow versus a bad workflow? That will depend upon the work that you got presented. Right. And and hence, again, I would say this thing as well that some uh, there is no best. There are right. only some good ways how exactly. we can create a, create a workflow. First thing I would say is things that you should not do. One thing I would say that you should not do is don't have the column with the job title. Okay. Because with that, we already started creating the silos. So if you see a workflow which says coding, Testing. What we started seeing is that people they see, I am the coder. Coders don't test. Testers don't code. We are already creating some kind of silos. Okay? Right. And hence, I would say that, okay, we need to break those probably by calling those uh, columns as something else, not just the job title. And then when we are defining our workflow, probably we should ask the team as well that, okay, if we have got this column, can someone also help in that as well? And hence, as a scrum master, I would say that becomes a really great facilitation to just talk about the people that nobody owns these columns. Okay. And also talk about things as well that, okay, we, sometimes many teams, they work on the different kind of work items. Okay. How the work flows, that what matters. So right. please don't do few things. Don't say that, okay, one person or the few people, they are owning that workflow. And also don't just think that the Scrum is only about, ident oh, Kanban is only about identifying the uh, workflow. Please apply the VIP limit. If you are not using the VIP limits, we are not using the Kanban. So hence define your VIP limits as well. That is, I would say, one of the really good practice that can help in building the collaboration among the people as well. That's great advice. Thank you. Right. So this question, so how do you encourage developers to speak out during the sprint retrospective or maybe speak up rather? So how do you encourage participation maybe amongst the quieter developers that don't seem to be contributing or maybe seem intimidated to contribute? What are some ways to facilitate that? 
I think one of the great way to facilitate is uh, liberating structures can help. Okay. Uh, what we need to do is we need to give opportunity for people to write down their thoughts, their feelings as well. So maybe the more anonymous you can bring, that can also bring the people um, to open up. And also when you are using certain techniques like one, two, four, all, you are creating an opportunity. So whenever you do the one, two, four, all, you have got everybody a one minute chance to talk about certain improvement actions, what they feel is going good, what they feeling is going bad. But I have seen that sometimes people, they even not participate in that. But when you put two people together in the pair, that additional accountability kicks in and people, they start opening up as well. Okay. And hence, I would say that if you use those liberating structures like one, two, four, all or individual writing, those things can help in opening up the people as well. And I would say one more thing as well. Do your retrospective on the retrospective. Okay. So talk about that, guys. How we can make our retrospective more participatory and make it anonymous. Invite the ideas from the people in and itself. Okay. So there is uh, nothing wrong in doing a retrospective on the retrospective in itself as well. Sometimes it is more powerful than just doing the retrospective and going with the motions. Makes sense. All right. So we are just about at time. I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, and then we will close this up and I will share all of these questions with you to address offline. So there are a couple more questions in here, just wanting some more clarity on how to pull Scrum and Kanban together. Um, I know you talked a little bit just now about how you can pull Kanban in, but can you talk a little bit about how to pull concepts of Kanban into Scrum and maybe some examples specifically related to the definition of done? Okay, great. Okay. There are a couple uh, more questions about that for more clarity or examples, so. I definitely think that when you define the workflow, it goes very closely with their definition of done as well. So I would always like to go backward from the release in and itself, okay? If you have got release, what are the things that we have to have to release? Then to have these things, what are the things that we have to have as well? So when we're going backward, I think a very good definition of done start coming up as well, but at the same time, a good definition of workflow start coming up as well. And Especially when you're talking about that, uh, how to pull the work. Maybe in if you are using the Scrum with Kanban, we always suggest that always pull the work from right to left. And there is a reason why we say that always pull the work from the right to left, because the work which are more towards the right, they are more closer to deliver the value. Remember the Kanban is optimizing the workflow, uh, optimize uh, the optimizing the flow of the value. So what we do is in the daily scrum, let's say for an example, if you're using the scrum with the Kanban, you will be talking about probably the items which is very close to getting the done as well. But okay, guys, this item is very close there. What's happening with that? Okay. And it may happen that one person may be struggling in that. And this is where we can ask the question to the people. Guys, can anybody go and help this person as well so that at least we can get this item towards the done. And this is where we start getting a really good concept of the Kanban stop starting, start finishing as well. So when we talk about this into the daily scrum, slowly, slowly our team, they start getting into this rhythm as well. And more importantly, Kanban also gives us a really good, uh, I would say, data point for the retrospectives as well. So sometimes I take the snip of our workflow during the daily scrum and take this into the retrospectives as well. So guys, can you see that this, at this moment, we broke our whip limits. Can you see that this item was sitting into this state for five days, nobody touched on it. And hence, I think we have got much better action point in itself as well. 
Awesome. Thank you. I hope that gave folks a little bit more clarity and ideas to think about. So with that, we are at our time. So I want to be mindful of everybody's time and respect the time box. So thank you so much, Lavanish, for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, don't forget to join us on June 14th. We are having an Ask a PST session with Lavanish. Um, so please come with your questions to that. And we will also figure out a way to answer our open questions here as well. And thank you audience for coming with such great questions. It seemed like we had a very captive audience today and it was great to have you all. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Scrum on. Okay, scrum on. Keep delivering the value, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>